Plants will come and follow me home from the nursery. I take sympathy on them. I decide to give them a home. And my wife was saying, and she is right, I'm gonna get more joy from seeing a butterfly or even bees. Oh my God, what did you do? Everything's gonna be okay. When they built my house, they didn't have heavy machinery. So they didn't come through and strip the land of all the good soil, sell it off and then put like an inch back over fill. I know this looks barbaric, how my knees are gonna be wet all day. Put your time into to doing things right and, and keeping them watered as opposed to using fancy chemicals or, you know, high phosphate stuff. You almost have to go out of your way to try to kill a plant. Good morning, everybody. Today is an absolutely gorgeous day. There was a frost this morning, but right now we have the sun shining. I've got a light sweatshirt on, but I'll be shedding that before long and the temperature in the garage is 43 and in the sun is 75 so it's probably in the mid 50s mid to upper 50s right now when you're buying a watering can look for ones with a nice wide opening here it's easier to get the hose in it's easier to to get leaves out if you need to get leaves out so i kind of settled when i bought these i wish i hadn't but i i think i just bought the first ones i saw which was a mistake but look at how small the area is here to put the hose in you know, as opposed as opposed to this one. And I know it's a minor detail, but it has consequences. First off, it's a pain to get the hose in that little hole hole. And second off, at this time of the year, when you get when you get leaves in your watering can and you're trying to get them out. Well, it looks like I got them all. It's just a pain. Look for ones with a nice big hole on them, please. I don't know if any of you folks have this problem, but quite often, you know, plants will come and follow me home from the nursery. And um, I take sympathy on them, I take pity on them, and I, I decide to give them a home. Quite often, I, I end up not getting around to planting them for several weeks. And that's kind of been happening with that load of plants. So what I've been doing is, um, just getting out and planting a few at a time when I can. It doesn't take long once you get to it, but by the end of the day, you can be quite uh, quite tired and just not have the energy you have first thing in the morning. So uh, I did get out yesterday and plant the arrowwood viburnum. And I just wanted to show you folks how this little brush thicket came out, which is my, my bird feeder area. And you'll still see the labels on them, but at some point I will pull the labels and what I do when, when I buy plants is I usually, I usually pull the labels unless it's something really rare for me, but then I keep a baggie in the garage and I just put one, one label from each plant in the baggie. And if I need to go back and figure out what something is, I can usually remember, you know, what the label looked like when I planted it or just figure out which ones it's not. And by doing that, figure out which ones it is. So I got the three arrowwoods in the front. There's two arrowwoods in the back. You know, I've got the um, the logs from the initial trying to make like a, a fence so that a hawk couldn't come swooping in here. And then, you know, my neighbor cut the apple tree and I brought those branches over. But I, I just really like the way this is. And, you know, it's gonna need maintenance because the branches are gonna get older and start falling apart. But I mean, there's always birds in the forsythia back here. There's always birds, uh, birds in the double file viburnum and there's some blue holly and uh, andromeda there. You know, so hopefully this, this is enough that they can come and, and do their snacking and um, not get become a snack. Just something to consider if you're into the birds. And my wife was saying, you know, but we're not gonna be able to see the birds if we, if we do this. And she is right. Sometimes I'll come out especially in the winters, you know, you get those long dark days and I'll just come out and uh, dress really warm and just sit out here for, you know, 15 minutes to a half hour and just watch the birds. Sometimes you just, uh, you need to get out in the winter. And I have to mention every time I put seed on this one that eventually I will be moving this one. You know, I don't like the way this one's out in the open, but at the same time, the woodpeckers are still okay with it. I'll see a squirrel up here once in a while, and sometimes even the ravens will land up there and eat that. So the blue jays have figured out I'm here. They're usually the first ones to figure it out. The ravens will usually show up around the time, the same time every day. I usually come out and do this the same time every day. 
actually a little bit early today. It's just a little more tricky doing this with the camera in one hand. It's just an amazing day. I, I wish I could convey, hopefully the sun, the blue skies, lack of wind and last, lack of frost is, is conveying what a gorgeous day it is. There's a titmouse in there. I saw a blue jay, saw several blue jays. I'm pretty sure I heard a chickadee. We'll let them be and let them, let them have their breakfast. Before we get going today, I just want to pop in these. There's eight plants over here. And then all I have left to plant is the flowering cabbage and the flowering kale. But I've got, um, it's such a new plant to me. Trisictris herda, herda toldily. I've got three herda toldilies. And then I put some, uh, I know this one, it's Asclepius. I just don't remember which one. Asclepius incarnata, the swamp milkweed. So I, I can't really say if this is the best spot or not for the swamp milkweed. Um, this is purple coneflower right behind it. But um, you know, the gutter dumps out over here and when it rains, the water goes this way. And the soil over here tends to stay wetter uh, most of the year. So I figure I'd put some over here and then I just put these other two here just because I don't know where else to put it, just to give it some balance. I don't really have a, 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 a damp spot year round on my property, but we're gonna give that a shot. And this, I just wanna show you folks this plant. I'm gonna end up cutting it back soon. And um, you smell that? See if I crush the foliage. It smells just like black licorice. And I forgot the name of it yet again, but it's supposed to be a plant that attracts uh, butterflies, hummingbirds, beneficial insects. It's supposed to be a really good plant. So just be aware of it. And by me searching the name of the plant, I can put it below and hopefully I'll get, I'll get around to remembering it. But I will be just cutting this back to the ground very soon. And the reason it looks so kind of unkempt is because I, I had it growing and I was about to cut it back and I saw a butterfly here. And then when I looked at the butterfly, it was just covered in bees. So I thought the pollinators would appreciate it too. So I, you know, this is kind of hokey for what I usually do. I'm trying to put nature first and, and think, you know, what would mother nature do? <laughs> Uh, which means sometimes the gardens are going to look a little hokey, but I'm going to get more joy from seeing a butterfly or even bees with somewhere to get nectar from than I will from a, a neat and tidy garden, which is a big step for me. So since we're going to go do a video about pruning, I do just want to show you this mountain laurel, Calmia latifolia. And if you take a look, you can see next year's blooms have already formed. So mountain laurel flowers on the previous season's growth so if you prune it heavy later in the season, it's gonna have very few flowers next year. But what I did this spring, I've got these Newport blue boxwood here and the mat laurel was growing into them and I decided I wanted to open things up a bit and I feel like I opened them up a little bit too much, but when you're pruning, you really can't, you have to listen to the shrub where it wants to be pruned. So you'll notice you know, I tried to take things back to the main stem. You know, I didn't want to leave like a stub sticking out. So I would have cut that to the main stem. There would have been something down here, something here. You know, so I cut everything back. But what I want you to notice is this Mount Laurel, which was probably close to this size when we moved in the house. I cut it back and it's developed buds and it's growing new buds all along the stem, way in the shrub older wood and it's growing new buds. So when you watch me doing all the pruning I'm doing today and I say it's gonna be okay, it's gonna bud out. Even down here, I mean, look at the size, look at the size of this. This is like a, I don't know, two and a half to three inch diameter piece of wood and it's still growing new buds. 
So just when you're pruning, don't, don't go nuts right away, but you know, try different things and see what works and prune a shrub and see if it grows back. If it doesn't grow back, don't do it again. If it does, you know, what can you do better? I mean, it just, um, shrubs, shrubs want to grow. So many times I'll be pruning and people will be like, oh my God, what did you do? And you know, I've done the exact same thing hundreds of other times, so I know everything's gonna be okay. All right, so we're just gonna go ahead and pop these three. Um, again, it's a new plant, Trisitris herta toldilly. We're gonna pop them in, and um, my soil is, uh, you know, I live in a farmhouse, which has been here for give or take 200 years, and when they, um, when they built my house, they didn't have heavy machinery, so they didn't come through and strip the land of all the good soil, sell it off, and then put like an inch back over fill, which is pretty much the way it's done around new houses these days. So my soil is good. So I don't even bother uh, adding amendments when I plant. However, if, if you were planting in, you know, where there was a new construction or, you know, just a sandy soil, you could always get some compost and just, uh, you know, it's just spread a little bit of compost around the hole or I really like dehydrated cow manure. You know, dehydrated cow manure means dry, so you want to go feel the bag and, and make sure the bag is dry, but then you just, you just hold it, I'm not sure if I'm in, you hold it under your arm and you just shake out a little bit around the hole, and then when you backfill, you, um, you can, uh, just mix it in. I don't usually incorporate uh, before backfilling, I just spread my amendments around the hole and then uh, incorporate as I backfill. And then we're going to just cut around the roots and um, pop her in the hole. Um, if I was mulching, I usually try to make the uh, the top of the pot like an inch high or so. Um, my gardens, I, I don't really mulch anymore. So I basically plant everything at the level of the ground. And then we're not really trying to, you know, super tamp things down. Just, uh, just make sure that, um, you know, the soil is, is tight around the roots so there's no air spaces. That's interesting. So the other thing I'm doing is I'm cutting them back. They're, they're perennials and, and it, you know, they're gonna regrow next year, but I'm cutting them back a little bit high so I remember they're here. You know, I could cut them lower, but I want them to kind of stick out a little bit so I can see where they are. And then what I'm doing here is, and I know this looks barbaric, but um, you see how these roots have started circling? And this is usually more with shrubs, but you don't want to have your roots circling. They end up choking the plant out. So usually it's like three times you'll, you'll run your spade along the edge of the, the root ball, maybe an inch in. For whatever reason, I, I do it four. I think just because I can tell these, these look like they're really aggressive plants and I wanna make sure that uh, that um, I just want to make sure basically that they don't end up dying, you know, in three or four years because they choke themselves out. So I know they're going to be fine. I know for me, I'd rather be a little too aggressive cutting than not aggressive enough and have them die in a few years. But um, that's what we're doing. Tricitrus herda, tall lily. Uh, 
You don't have to get down on your knees. I, I could be doing this standing up. I probably would be. I don't know why I'm on my knees, because now my knees are going to be wet all day. But um, you know, that's what you're doing. And then what you do is you, um, as you're planting, I try to keep my pots together. It's just that way you don't go back and pick up all these pots. And then if I'm, you know, planting in an existing garden like this, I'll just go back with a rake. And I'm not even really trying to like grade per se. I just want, I just want to spread the soil around. So the first time it rains, the soil looks just the way it did. You know, it looks like nobody was here. And the only stuff, you know, if there's a little bit of junk, I'll pick that up. It, it depends on the garden. Again, old farmhouse, really good soil. So there's like no rocks, but I'll pick up small rocks. If I see him. So, I mean, you, you know, you, you can't even tell I planted these. And now I've got the, uh, the told lily, which is a late fall bloomer. And then this is actually Lenten Rose, which blooms like in late March, early April. So, you know, we've got the full gamut here. And then the final thing, and even though the soil here is, um, is fairly damp, you really want to give plants a good drink, unless you're planting in the middle of a rainstorm, which is pretty much the best time to plant. Um, you want to give your plants a good a good drink so you know just remember to give them a drink it's going to compact the soil around the roots you're going to make sure sometimes when you plant stuff the the plant roots are dry but the soil is wet so you're just ensuring everything has even moisture the plant is stressed out as little as possible and and things move forward quickly and you know, there are companies that sell um, high phosphate mixes for, you know, helping with transplant shock. And, um, you know, I used to use them, but it seems like the secret is really just to keep your water going on a regular basis. Um, if you want to keep plants from getting transplant shock, put your time into to doing things right and, and keeping them watered as opposed to using fancy chemicals or, you know, high phosphate stuff. Focus on adding some compost to the, the soil when you backfill, some cow manure, and then just, um, you know, just make sure you keep them watered. It's really, you know, plants want to grow. The thing I've learned over time is, is plants, they want to grow and you almost have to go out of your way to try to kill a plant because they want to grow. All right, folks, I've got five more to go. And because I'm a big talker when no one talks back. All right, folks, I've got five more to go. So I'm going to go pop those in and then we'll head up and, and do some more pruning.